Hey guys, this is Ayush Vadva and welcome to another episode of the CNTC show. Today in this episode we have a very very special person his name is Aves Ahmed he is the co-founder and CEO of Pixel Pixel is a space tech startup and they recently raised 5 million dollar in seed funding what is pixel what they're trying to do in the space tech arena and how these 22 year old founders were able to create such a huge impact in the space industry so many things to learn from this one we talked a lot about his entrepreneurial journey how pixel was built and formed planets satellites the future of space exploration and a lot of really really fascinating stuff to learn from this podcast episode so do listen to the entire episode let's welcome avais ahmed on the cntc show Hello Ways, welcome to the CNTC show. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Ayush. Thanks for having me here. How are you? I'm great. Uh it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Before we dive into the sections and the questions, uh why don't you give the audience an introduction about yourself, about what you're doing at Pixel and what is Pixel all about? Sure. So I uh, am a graduate from Bits Pilani. Uh I pursued a master's in mathematics there and while still at Bits, uh, founded this company called Pixel. Pixel is in essence a space data company and there's two aspects to that the space aspect and the data aspect what we're doing is we're building a constellation of satellites that will cover the earth they'll take photographs of this earth and uh, once that data is down on earth we will take this data analyze it uh, for use cases in agriculture climate change forestry uh, and a whole host of other sectors so we're essentially i think you can say glorified space photographers and we analyze that data uh, so that's where the space and the data aspects come in Our first satellite is uh, manufactured and ready to launch, uh, and the second one is being built that will launch next year on a SpaceX rocket. Um, the eventual plan is to have about 30 satellites that will provide the global coverage uh, every 24 hours, no matter what geographical location you are uh, on the Earth. So that's uh, in a nutshell what we're doing at Pixel. Right. When you say 30 satellites, uh, when do you plan to actually launch them? The timeline right now, as I said, the first satellite is built, ready to go. That's the proof of concept, uh, and uh, it will launch in a few months. and the second one will be uh, during the second half of 2021 once these two are gone and have demonstrated the uh, utility that uh, they're supposed to do uh, the plan is to launch 30 more in 2022 so we have about 12 months uh, more than 12 months from the launch of the second satellite to deploying the constellation uh, and at that time it's just a matter of replicating the first two satellites into this 30 so the schedule right now is uh, that by the end of 2022 uh, we plan to have the 30 satellites up there That's awesome man and and if i may ask where are they taking off from like is that information which you're supposed to give <laughs> so the first one uh, we looked at it came down to you know launching from either shri harikota india to israel or launching from uh kazakhstan to the russian space agency right. but uh, due to host of factors like timeline and cost we went with the russian space agency uh, so they're launching from uh, kazakhstan uh, this place called baikonur uh in fact it happens to be the same place from where uh, uh earth's first man went to space yuri gagarin launch so it's going to wow. be the same launch pad from where uh, we're going to be launching the first one the second one is on a spacex rocket uh this will be uh, from either vandenberg or um, uh, florida uh, in uh, the us that sounds awesome and i've heard you're a elon musk fan as well um i um i wouldn't say a fan but i do uh, keep hold him in high regard uh, he's been an inspiration and a motivation um and um, uh, like growing up i when spacex came into the forefront i wanted to work in spacex um and couldn't because of a whole host of reasons because only us nationals and distant is supposed to do that uh, but yeah what he has done and uh, he has paved the way for others to say that you know hard problems are something that you can solve as entrepreneurs as well so um uh, yeah he's been he's been someone uh, to look up to and see how to get things done that's awesome uh, you talked about how pixel was started while you were still in college uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how the initial team was formed what were the initial struggles of the team and you know how did you get over them so it's a, it was it's an interesting story um uh, while i joined bits uh you know the every almost everyone while growing up we loved space and even i did uh, but then that sort of gets suppressed while we're studying for ge and bits and get into the rat race and what not and it was similar with me but when i joined bits there was this team called team anand which was a student uh, satellite team at the campus who were working with isro and i became a part of that in the first year so i got to see you know what works on the satellite and uh, you know that was the first pressure actually working on space hardware and not just dreaming about it 
Uh, second and third years were spent uh, on the Hyperloop team. I was one of the founding team members. Uh, my senior Sibesh was the founder. We managed to, you know, build this, take it to LA, present it to Elon Musk and SpaceX and whatnot. So there was that experience in uh, Anant as well as the Hyperloop team. Uh, but after coming back from the SpaceX competition, which is the, uh, which is where we took the Hyperloop pod, uh, we, uh, I wanted to just take a look, take a step back and see what it is that I want to do. So I spent um, a few months after coming back to look at different fields that could possibly create an impact uh, in the coming years. I read about quantum computing, I read about uh, you know nuclear technology, nuclear energy, I read about space technology. Uh, and while reading about it, I um, uh, decided that you know space is something that there was always that love for and this is what I would want to do for the rest of my life. Um, but uh, it was a little segue there in the sense there was another competition called the IBM Watson AI Prize. Uh, that competition stated you use AI to tackle humanity's problems, do good for the Earth, and um, uh, try to work with satellite imagery and AI. So I decided, uh, you know, AI and satellite imagery went well. Uh, I went to my co-founder, Shitej, and said, look, this is something cool that we can do. Uh, and we were looking at tackling problems we had first-hand seen, you know, Pilani is in Rajasthan, and Rajasthan has an illegal mining problem. Uh, and Delhi and Gurgaon, we keep hearing, you know, are some of the most polluted cities in the world. Um, and every year in the newspaper, we read how, you know, agricultural crops are devastated by pests and diseases and whatnot. Satellite imagery was one data set when combined with AI that could help tackle a lot of issues. So we saw that thing and said, okay, this is something we could do. Uh, a lot of it is available online. We can use this data, build algos. But that's when we ran into a more fundamental issue. The issue was that... Uh, if you were trying to get up-to-date data, it was either not rich enough in information, we couldn't even see certain problems, uh, or the second issue was it was very expensive. If you were trying to get it, like even companies or even as students, we couldn't afford to get it and be able to do the things we wanted to do. Um, but the important issue I said was we couldn't even see certain problems we wanted to see. If you were trying to tackle emissions in Delhi and Gurgaon, where were these emissions coming from? How is air pollution changing? Uh, most satellite uh, cameras that were there couldn't uh, look at that information. Uh, and we reached out to organizations around the globe that worked with satellite imagery in one form or the other. And um, that's when we realized that, okay, we have found here an opportunity and a gap that could possibly be filled. And growing up in India, we had seen what ISRO had done, right, with limited resources. Uh, you must have seen the articles where they said the, the Mars mission cost less uh, for ISRO than it cost to make the movie Martian, or uh, the Moon mission cost less to make the movie Gravity. Um, so there was the expertise, the experience, and the infrastructure here, and we could do it at a very cost-effective price. And it becomes important in an industry like space because you're spending lots of money to send hardware up there. Um, all of this sort of, you know, combined at that time, it clicked that, you know, there's this love for space. Uh, being in India gives you certain advantages that you should make use of. And there was an opportunity and a gap here where we could do something better, you know, globally. Um, and um, uh, my co-founder and I, we decided this is what we're going to do. Uh, and we started to work on that, reaching out to people and trying to see how we could build it. Uh, the Hyperloop experience definitely helped. Um, and an interesting thing is it started off as a student team where we said we would build and launch this satellite as a, a student. We would raise sponsorship. We would do it through bits. Uh, but during that process, we realized that raising sponsorship is not going to be uh, very effective and not a lot of people are going to want to put money uh, to send something that might not even work. Um, uh, and during the course, uh, you know, well, uh, through trial and error, it, uh, made sense that, you know, there's an opportunity, a long-term opportunity here to actually create impact and it could be done as a startup. Uh, an investment is something that people would be more willing to do than sponsorship because, you know, as an investment, they have um, a pendant for returns and whatnot. Um, so apart from myself and Shetaj, we had, uh, thankfully, uh, people from our own batch and our junior batch who we managed to convince to come down with us to Bangalore and say, uh, look, we're going to go build a satellite. Do you want to join us? And they said, yeah, sure, why not? Um, so I think that's one good thing about BITS that, you know, people are willing to sort of uh, do something uh, risky and daring. So that's how it came to be. Once we had that, we started to like, get into it and uh, yeah, I haven't stopped. That's a really, really cool story. So from uh, how many initial founders? I think four, right? Yeah, two founders and two founding team engineers. Two founding yeah. team engineers. So, two uh, 35 people right now. Two 35 people right now, approximately, yes. In this process of uh, moving from four to 35 people, you must have acquired a lot of talent. Right. And I, and I guess when you are acquiring this talent to build something which is so technologically advanced, you must need a lot of experienced people. So how do you get these experienced people to sort of join an early age startup? So it's 
changed now it's much easier now people know that there's validity and credibility here so we can go out and uh, it's easier right now it's not like as easy but uh, to start with uh, we were about just these four people for quite some time right from this we knew each other we had each other's back and quite a few months where it was just us but then what we did as you said is you know it can't be just for students who are trying to learn things because no matter how quickly one can pick things up there's always going to be certain things that come with experience right the first thing we did was we got on board some advisors who were really experienced in the field these were people from isro these were people who had built and run satellites so having advisors uh, helped but then building a full time team uh, took some time we went from you know these four people to gradually getting two people last year um, so we were just about six people in january this year Right. Uh, and then after that we have kept on adding people month on month but in terms of how we went about it is um, we just scoured the internet for people with the relevant skill set uh, look at linkedin uh, what have people done whether what they are doing actually fits into what we are trying to do so very specific right. technical people and then reach out to them sometimes it took months to convince them sometimes they were on board in a few weeks but essentially it's just meeting them explaining to them that this is what we are trying to do and uh, some of them are just Uh, some of them were uh, i would say uh, uh, smitten by the vision they saw that you know this could become something big um, and one to be very candid thing that helped is you know there was this team called team indus which is also an inspiration for us uh, and they were trying to build a lunar rover to the moon so they had set up a wonderful team uh, but then things didn't really go well for them so people are engineers that team indus were trying to move out uh, and they were looking for something in space so that became a little easier in that you know there was somewhere we could get people in but now it's you know with um, Uh, as having the satellite built with us having the launch book with us having raised funding uh, it becomes easier to sort of convince people um, but at the early stage it was just go out and tell to tell the vision and uh, uh, you know uh, like convince them after weeks to be able to come on board and in this process of finding people looking for talent was there ever a time when people did not take you seriously because of how young you are uh, in the initial days yes i think in late 20 starting out um, we talked to a bunch of investors and people and they strung us along we talked to them for quite some months but then they decided to not invest in us um, and later we found out that it was because we, we were very young they didn't have the confidence that even if we could build the technology we could go out and maybe raise you know future money or be able to execute on that um, so that age played a part but then there's also another side to this here in that uh, bitsians were more willing to trust us and uh, that's where the initial bunch of money to be able to take this off came from so there are both people but uh, yeah people um, a, a lot of places don't uh, take young people seriously especially here in india where you know uh, if you see isro the people leading projects are you know uh, 40 50 60 years of age Uh, and then when students go up to them and say we're going to do something better than you they are uh, going to be like okay these people are nuts um so it in the early days it's uh, it it has been tough a lot of people didn't believe us but uh, you don't need everyone to believe you just need a small subset of people to uh, which i'm uh, uh, like lucky to have been able to find but uh, it's been as i said with regards to getting people it's easier but it's also with regards to now uh, people take a lot more seriously because we can show that you know it's not just something that we are doing in spare time it's something that we are serious about it. right that makes sense you talked about isro and i was reading the other day that isro is starting to take uh, is commercializing themselves they are moving to the private sector so what are your thoughts on it and how does it affect your work it affects us in um, just to give a bit of a thing right we saw how things work in the us and we see how things work in india in india we sort of have had to be completely stand alone without any dependence on the government which is sort of a good thing which means that you know you're not dependent on certain things which is cut off then you're going to die uh, which is good in that way but then if you look at companies in the us uh, they have a lot of grant funding they have government support government contracts with them and they have made it easy for them to work with startups which still hasn't been the case here especially with regards to space there's no space law there's no space policy there's no clarity uh, but there's the infrastructure experience and the expertise in terms of what isro has done so like exactly what they're trying to do right now is take that uh, whatever they have built and help commercialize it so it hasn't happened yet uh, but just a few months ago as i said they have announced the intention of privatizing it and working with private players so the which means that it it is the right time right now to get into space because things will start getting up here and uh, india will try to you know uh, see how we can compete with other countries and the other startups that are there but until now it's been like the startups that have been there that are very few uh, they have had to be stand alone and work themselves without having to depend on government or isro or anything else uh, which will change and which will help more startups to come up and help existing startups to speed up their work 
Right. So, in general, it's it's a blessing for every uh, buddy working in the industry. I guess it's an added bonus. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Even and we've seen one thing that you know a lot of people at Israel they are they have been neither content with the government job that they have that they're going to have retirement the post that they get. But right. we've been seeing recently that a lot of people are reaching out to us. We are reaching out to other startups to move from Israel to the private sector because we see that as more exciting, more fast moving. Uh, so that way things are really moving in the positive direction. And like only when a lot of startups come up and innovation happens, uh, you know Israel will continue to do what it does. The other companies will do continue to what they do. And when combined together uh, is where the magic happens. So the pan. pandemic has affected almost every single business and you closed a round recently it closed a funding round so two questions a how did the pandemic affect pixel in general and how were you able to actually close a round what were the problems that you faced and what was the process of getting over them so pandemic i think it was majorly a minor temporary distractions or roadblocks that it created but in the long term i think it has increased demand for actually the images and the services that we provide right they'll come to both of them so the first thing was i think a couple of things it affected us specifically is one delay of timeline uh, we were actually supposed to have launched our satellite by now but it's been pushed to a few months ahead because of uh, uh, covid and a lot of things got delayed the second thing that it affected us in terms of is um, the supply chain disruption so when we build satellites we get components uh, from around the world europe from the us from north america from uh, wherever and when travel stopped and people companies had to stop and nothing was being able to do there so supply chain is a very uh, sensitive thing that needs to be sort of very optimized for us to be able to keep our timeline uh, so timeline got delayed and the supply chain was disrupted uh, another small disruption was that you know uh, as a hardware company uh, we need to be in one place to be able to build something we are hands on people uh, but um, we had to adapt to working from home Uh, it sort of worked out because we were finishing the manufacturing of the first satellite and moving into the design of the second satellite so a lot of it was design work simulation work uh, which um, worked out but that was how it temporarily impacted i think now things are starting to get back to normal uh, but long term wise a lot of people now don't want to send people to remote areas they don't want to send people they want to have some sort of a system where they can remotely check things which is where our imagery comes in be it agriculture you know be it uh, energy companies oil and gas companies Uh, no matter what asset they would want to track, we could help that. So long term, I think it's been good, but short term, like everyone else, we've had some issues as well. But things starting to get back to normal. Coming to the funding, um, so here's here's the story. So we've been trying to raise this round since about uh, November last year. Uh, November, mid November is when you know we came back to India from the US after the accelerator and whatnot, and we started fundraising properly. January is when we had a term sheet to say that we are going to raise a 3.5 million dollar round. We had the investors come in, we had everything done. Term sheet was there, and we were doing it. And then in March, um, you know, things started getting serious. Lockdown happened. People didn't know what was going to happen with the economy and whatnot. So a few investors got a little jittery, uh, and uh, we had to go back to the drawing board and say that you know, one, we had extra money on the table that we had said no to because of a variety of reasons that we wanted to keep it this much. Uh, and the second is you know the existing. Uh, investors that were there were, were needed to be reshuffled because uh, of cold feet and whatnot. Um, so we had to restart the process from April uh, remotely. People like no one was traveling, and we had to be there. Um, but a few people that were there in that early round, you know, still stuck by. And then we went out and uh, we uh, had conversations with Lightspeed that came in. We had conversations with Loom that came in, and both of this happened remotely. Um, so I think it, there were. i think one or two months where uh, people were unwilling to put in the money they were not sure what was going to happen but uh, thankfully there were people uh, that saw the promise in what we were doing and it took um, quite some time since then to be able to put it all together a whole host of other things due to pandemic due to being remote but the um, yeah we just kept at it and uh, that that's that sort of how it happened uh, thankfully we were able to pull it together um, as of a couple of months ago <laughs> I'm glad you were able to, and I genuinely believe that if if the idea is strong and you have the proof of concept as well, uh, this is just a small like a speed breaker in a very long <laughs> on a very very long road. I'm gonna I'm gonna shift the tone to a very like to a lighter note. Uh, we talked about Elon Musk, uh, and Elon Musk does all sorts of weird things on his Twitter. On he smokes up on a on a podcast so what are what are your thoughts on on this like on this behavior of his do you think it's strategic or is it just like random i think a couple of things one he's an inspiration in terms of the work he does but then he's not a personal inspiration in terms of his personal life is so it's 
few different things there. That said, um, it's a part of his brand. Uh, like he is Tesla, he is basic, and if something happens to him, then uh, things are gonna not really go that well. They might still survive, but like he is the face of those companies, and there's a certain brand he has. For example, Tesla is a, a direct-to-consumer company. He like he, they want as many people to buy cars as possible. Like for example, what they did with uh, the SpaceX launch, where he put his own Tesla on the rocket, that helped two companies, two of his own companies, which was both SpaceX and Tesla, and that got like immense uh, coverage everywhere. And people know about Tesla, and people want to like it's like a brand signal now. Like iPhone used to be a, a branding thing, where you know people getting iPhone it used to be a signaling thing. It's the same thing with the Tesla right now, where one obviously is an electric car, which is supposed to be good for the environment, and second is is sort of a signaling status right now. And in terms of uh, like his Twitter and other antics, I think he's at a point right now where he. Doesn't give two shits about what anyone else thinks. He's at that point where he can go out and do what he wants. Uh, he wants to like once SpaceX and Tesla there. He he wants to create tunnels. He he's, he's unhappy with traffic. He sits in his car and tweets out that you know I'm going to create a tunnel. And then a couple of months later there is a boring company. Boring company. Uh, and he says uh, <laughs> and um, uh, you know like he essentially uh, uh, like he, he and you know they sold flamethrowers and sold hats and whatnot to be able to raise money for the boring company. So he's at a point where he has the the money, the status, and the authority to sort of do what he wants and be himself. Um, and it's also now part of his brand, right? That's what. uh people like want to see from him and people relate to uh, rather than someone being very formal and things like that so um yeah it's it's, it's good it's good for him and it's good for his companies and anyone else that sort of gets uh, benefited by it <laughs> so there was a joke around Elon Musk that uh whenever he wants to feel something because things are going so well for him he just tweets okay tesla stock shouldn't be this much <laughs> 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 so when he loses someone yeah. he's like hi okay now i feel something now i'm not numb anymore <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. anyway i remember um, last semester or something we were in a cab ride from loharu to palani and he told me that uh, you have very strict boundaries when it comes to your personal life and your work life like you won't turn on your laptop after 8 pm until it's like completely necessary and you'll you give yourself free weekends and good time to relax is is that still the case and if yes then you think it's important to do this it is i think uh, sometimes you're going to get busy and uh, you know there are calls from uh, i would say 8 am in the morning till about 12 30 in the night right uh, and those days you can't help it but in general i at least try to keep uh, at least an hour and hour and a half aside every day to be able to do other things that they would want to do like reading a book which is mostly that or you know spending time with the family and what not uh, because it's important like um, we are yet still young and i know that you know we can go ahead and work for 7 days 14 days at a stretch without taking a break and we have done that but after a point it sort of starts to take a toll on you and you're still doing work and you can still go but it's not as efficient the things that you could have gotten in one day start taking three days you start missing things you start you know uh, not looking at things um and um uh, like while i was at bits that boundary was uh, there was not a lot of work then as we were starting out i think when we had that conversation it was a little easier but then after that it got very busy where you know monday to sunday no matter what especially when we are trying to fundraise or do something else um that boundary sort of blurs and there's no sundays there's no weekends but uh, at least whenever there is a possibility um uh, like try to keep work hours within a certain range uh, which nowadays is about i would say 8 am to 8 pm uh, and after 8 pm see to be able to do something else and usually keep aside uh, second half of the saturday uh, and the entire sunday free to be able to do other stuff which is important because you know taking at least one and a half or two days out there makes the other five days much more efficient um uh, and um, yeah otherwise you know things uh, like things start to blur between your professional and personal life things are not going well Uh, on your professional side, and you start taking out that irritation and angst out on the personal uh, relationships that you have, which is not really good. Uh, it has taken some time to be able to do that, but I think that's very important to do, no matter whether you're doing your academics or whether you're studying or whether you're doing something else. Uh, people need to take time out to do something that they like, love, uh, and something that makes them relax. Right. You talked about other things. uh what apart from pixel makes this aways like what are some of the other things which you enjoy to do <laughs> <laughs> um so i think one is i like traveling um pixel has helped a little in there you know takes me to places and things like that but before that you know going uh, to places and looking at things and just enjoying traveling would be one 
uh, but most of the time it's uh, i would say reading books and especially reading science fiction uh, that's for a couple of things one i like science fiction and the second is it gives me ideas in terms of what to do with pixel beat space technology or something else um, and uh, once in a while you know watch tv shows or something else um uh, so i think that's about it i think traveling uh, uh, and reading and watching something um video games would be one other aspect uh, where if i'm trying to take time off i would do that uh sometimes watch sports like formula 1 or uh, football uh maybe so i think that would that would be everything else apart from pixel but uh, i i don't think for the past year year and a half there's been a lot of time but as i said during weekends or something like that it's spread across these things talking of of science fiction obviously uh what are your thoughts on space exploration in the next 5 10 years so um i think space exploration in the past 40 years has not really been progress has not as been as much as it should have been uh in between 1960 and 1970 or even 1980 the amount of progress that happened where in 1961 or 62 john f kennedy said that we are going to send people to the moon and then in 1969 they did uh, and then uh, the other thing that happened that was very rapid but then the funding started building and things like that but what has happened i think in the past few years is that interest has been rekindled and there are people uh, private people with the money to be able to do this for interested in space uh, and they don't have to just depend on the government uh, in the next 5 years we are going to um, you know see uh, existing companies become more matured and people starting to see worldwide that this industry is not just uh, you know out on the frontier there is something that uh, we will there's a logical next step uh, after a point in time the resources on earth are going to be limited after a point in time the things that you need to do here are limited you need to expand somewhere into outer space and it and it honestly fascinates us right be it going to mars or setting up something there or be it going back to the moon um and the money has been flowing into the space sector which is good In the next five years, it will predominantly be looking at how space technology can help the Earth. But in the next ten, fifteen years, we will start seeing, you know, outposts uh, orbiting the Moon. Uh, hopefully, habitats on the Moon. Uh, we will have landed people on Mars uh, and have habitats on Mars, and you know, trying to uh, not have all our eggs in one basket, which is the Earth. Uh, so, being able to build uh, um, things and exploring the solar system. So one, one, uh, I think, interesting aspect or a surprising aspect is that. Uh, We haven't really explored the solar system. We don't even really know what's happening in a lot of planets, even though we know their names. Uh, very recently, an announcement came that there's possibly signs of life on Venus, uh, where they found phosphine, which might be, you know, there might be signs of life there. Um, and we haven't known that since now, which you would have expected to know. Uh, so, to be able to rapidly and inexpensively get access to any body on the solar system we want, be it the moons of Saturn or Jupiter, we will see a lot of those missions, uh, not just. being spearheaded by space agencies like NASA or ISRO but by private companies like Rocket Lab and even as we do have plans to send our uh, small satellites to the asteroid belt uh, the mars or anywhere else so that's i think how the next 10 15 years will shape out well, what do you think about aliens what do you think about extraterrestrial beings it's a fascinating topic and uh, I'm glad you asked it because i've been reading about the fermi paradox uh, quite extensively for the past few months during lockdown fermi paradox essentially states that you know Uh, we know that there are so many billions and trillions of stars there are so many galaxies uh, and then almost all of these stars are planets revolving around them so in terms of the probability itself the sheer number of planets that should have had life and uh, we should have been able to see life should have been at least enormous they should have been at least a few who should have been in contact with but we haven't been so where are all the aliens right um, so i think one is to keep aside the uh, urban myths such as you know ufos or the aliens built the pyramids the other thing is to actually seriously think about uh, like why haven't we contacted aliens or whether they're actually there there's a whole host of reasons that people come up with for that be it you know there's something called the great filter which life has to pass uh, and only if that passes can they become an interplanetary species and for us that might um, for example uh, one of the examples for the great filter could be gaining consciousness life might like uh, bacteria and then you know at a point in time we gain consciousness and primates became human and became intelligent so that might be one great filter um so uh, or becoming space faring building rockets to be able to get out of earth would be uh, one great filter so that is one possible explanation the other possible explanation is that life is just very rare uh, we happen to be you know one in a trillion 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 something fluke uh, where life happened here um or uh, uh, like there are still aliens but they are so far spread apart that no matter like due to the 
uh, like light takes some time to travel so to be able to communicate with them is just not possible and by the time uh, uh, any other civilization comes up this civilization might have already uh, got an extinct but um, i honestly think that you know it's very very likely given the sheer number of galaxies and super clusters and what not that are there in the universe that we know of uh, somewhere out there it must be some sort of a life which we possibly can't imagine or we can imagine um, so the probability of that is high but maybe the probability of finding them is not that high so uh, but as and how instruments uh, get much stronger and uh, you know we are able to send things out to deep space and be able to look at look around uh, we might find possibly some signs but as of now uh, yeah that those are my thoughts <laughs> um, sorry for that information dump but i've just been reading up quite a bit so yeah <laughs> i think it's really really fascinating for me a lot of things were super new because i don't read a lot about space and and this just motivated me to sort of go out and read a few articles today which i'm going to do by the way <laughs> but thank you for actually thank you so much for all of those insights uh, i think it's really really interesting and very fascinating at the same time i'm going to go back to pixel and ask you this one basic question in a lot of startups there comes a point where uh, things don't go your way you know you expect a flow and things don't go your way so was there ever a point in uh, pixel that things weren't going your way and you faced a low point and if yes then what is the process of getting over it there were i think um, um it's been in general a positive journey but a disclaimer there i'm also a very super optimistic person so even if things are really bad i'll look at the positive side that said there were a few few small amounts of time where things seemed like you know oh, uh, we might not be able to figure it out or we might not be able to get out of here but that was exciting at the same time that was like a challenge that we now have to go and figure this out right uh, a few things would be uh, when we were designing the satellite and starting to manufacture it um, we had no clue as to okay we can put together a design a nice cad a nice design this looks great how do we go ahead and manufacture it who do we partner with uh, and uh, like weeks went by with how, when we were trying to figure out how we would do uh, as and when we looked at cost the costs were exorbitant for us to be able to afford it um, but i think the majority of the time it would be when we were trying to raise funds in the initial initial time where uh, i'd put all my savings uh, broken the fd and everything into it and almost all of that had been wiped away because we had spent it on prototypes now we definitely needed external investors to be able to come in because otherwise we wouldn't have survived so at that point in time we didn't know whether three months down the line we would have enough money to be able to do this um, and we couldn't start spending on actually building the satellite and so it was like a cash 22 situation we needed money to be able to build something to show to investors uh, and to be able to build that we actually made money from the investors right that's where uh, i think bit alumni came into the picture and they sort of helped um an interesting story there is we were trying to we were still students and we were still spending from our own pockets um as i said like uh, we were in chennai at the time trying to get the satellite manufactured and uh, we were trying to raise money and one investor um this was a tuesday and um, i sent out a mail to this investor asking whether there is any update like what's happening we have been talking about this investment and he said why don't we meet on thursday Uh, so I'm in Chennai on Tuesday, and I have to be uh, somewhere in Maharashtra on Thursday. So booked a ticket that day, which came out to be fairly expensive because just two days. Uh, flew to Nagpur, uh, and um, uh, we talked about you know Elon Musk and the thing, and explained to them the vision. But uh, in the end, I think there were a couple of things that uh, sold it to them, which was one: if you ever get to meet Elon Musk during the course of our work again, uh, they will be there during the meeting, so we will have them meet him. So that was I think one thing. the other thing is we said we're building the satellite uh, we will have the satellite named after whatever you want it named so you will have something up there in space that is named after us what so i think that can mean the first money to come in um uh, but uh, and once that was there we were able to pull the rest of it together but during that time i think it was like whether we will we get it will we not why will people trust a bunch of 21 year olds uh, like is this even worth pursuing should we be looking at placements and what not but uh, never at that time like um, did i personally think that there's something that we should stop it was like a challenge there and it like we just didn't have clarity in terms of what would happen but there was never a doubt that we should just keep at it and like until there's nothing else left to do um apart from that there's not been really that many low points i'm i'm glad to hear that actually it's it's very positive i'm going to pick very small thing from what you said is having your name out there and i remember as a kid i always wanted a plot of land on the moon i don't know why but always had this fascination 
but as a kid uh, talking about you uh, were you always fascinated about like space i was yeah so i remember it all started because my dad used to get me these encyclopedias um, which had the space section as well and there were few encyclopedias which were just space books so to be able to come back from school open them eating maggi in the side and just looking uh, through the encyclopedias uh, it's just inherently fascinating to humans i believe like it, human human kind yearns for something adventurous and what's more adventurous than going out there um, it's sort of like when people left off from europe to be able to find what else is there on the earth now we're just trying to look what else is there beyond earth um, Uh, and uh, yeah, I just I remember this that you know reading reading these encyclopedia, looking at the pictures of galaxies, black holes, quasars, pulsars, and whatnot, uh, and being fascinated. And I remember I told my dad as well that I'm going to become an astronaut. That's what I'm going to become. I want to go to space, uh, and then I want to be able to work at NASA, and then when SpaceX came, it's SpaceX. Um, uh, but you know, there's a whole host of other challenges there. So that interest was always there. I remember I also bugged my dad to get me a telescope to be able to see the stars and uh, to be able to be fascinated by it. Um, uh, but then it sort of gets you know subdued. Tenth happens, and then eleventh and twelfth, they're preparing for GE. So that sort of got pushed in the back end. Two things that rekindled that. One I mentioned as part of the student satellite team. But the other thing was uh, when we went to the SpaceX headquarters during the competition, they took us on a tour of the SpaceX factory. We saw rocket engines being built. Uh, we got to touch the rockets that had been to space and come back and landed down here on Earth. So that rekindled the thing that yeah, this is the this is the space that I want to be in. So let's figure out something to do here. Okay, do you have a favorite planet? <laughs> uh, the favorite planet I would definitely say is Earth. <laughs> Earth. Uh, it's a boring answer, but then um, uh, like the more you look at it, the more you read about it, you see how fascinating the ecology is. It's, it's very sensitive, and even a few little changes here and there in terms of the timelines could have meant that there is no life here. But apart from Earth, if I were to look at uh, any other planet here, that would be. Um, Like there's a lot of fictional planets I like, but then if you're talking about the ones in the solar system, uh, it would uh, probably be uh, Saturn. Uh, uh, it has cool moons, uh, and uh, you know it has the ring to so to be able to see something from there in terms of the rings would be cool. So I think yeah. Right. I wasn't expecting Earth at all. I I thought you'd say like <laughs> some random planet, <laughs> but that's cool. Uh, talking about your college life, you're from the same college, and I wish we had interacted more when you know you were si- still in college. How was your college life like? And I want to know: Did you ever think in college that you'd end up here? This is like before the hyperloop thing, you know. Like, did you think that you'll be actually making something, making a product which will be in the space tech arena? Honestly, no. I think when I came into bits, it was like you know I will. Uh, I was. I was like. I had the option of choosing any degree that I wanted, except uh, a bachelor's in computer science. Uh, but then I wanted a computer science degree, so I said I'm not going to choose any other engineering degree. I'm going to do a master's in math and then take CS as a tool. Uh, and coming here in the first year didn't really study a lot, which meant that I didn't have the CG to be able to get computer science that I wanted. So um, when I joined, what uh, I decided that uh, like I wanted to do after getting out of bits is you know get a nice secure plum job at some software company and be happy and enjoy life. But um, yeah, so never really like getting into bits didn't really think that this is what I sort of wanted to do. It happened, but but the life in bits sort of changed that. I think talking to people who are interested in what they do, they're fascinating people at bits. Uh, the biggest. thing that i think i took from bits was the people that i interacted with who are really smart at what they want and like just go out and do what they want um so that happened during the course of uh, of bits uh, and my my um predominant years at bits were spent doing something or the else so there was obviously the academic aspect of it which was sort of the bare minimum but uh, i think at the end of first semester uh, and you know second year it was team anand uh, which took up a majority of the time uh and then after that it was hyperloop india uh, which took up a majority of the time again uh, and then after that immediately after a few months uh, of hiatus uh, it was fixed so uh, at any point in within life there was something else that i was doing that took up a significant amount of time and honestly i learned more from those three stints than i did uh, through academics uh, it's just that how i'm wired i think it's it's it's, uh, it's just easier to learn doing things rather than just going and studying that was my my life i think um, talking to smart people uh who love what they do who have different aspects in life and just you know riffing off them and brainstorming with them and uh and the opportunities that it gave me uh like there's team anand okay i want to be in team anand 
uh, there was the opportunity to participate in the hyperloop competition and then like i decided okay this is something that we can do uh, it's like that quote where you know if you're offered a seat on a rocket ship you don't ask why you get on <laughs> um, so we really think a lot about it just got into it and i think at hyperloop is when things changed i looked at what a bunch of motivated students uh, with a certain deadline and the same vision can do uh, we were competing with phd graduates and masters from the bands of mit and stanford and we were going out there and competing with what we had built here in india um and we saw that yeah if if people actually put their mind to something uh, even students can be able to pull it off which gave us the confidence ki okay uh, that's when i decided that we have been able to go from having nothing in the physical form to having a working hyperloop pod prototype in 3 months if we can do that then we can go out and do anything else that's when i think things changed that's a really really motivating story and i really relate to bits and pieces of it when you said that um, you never really learn from the classes or the curriculum that bits offered but from the people around from the conversations around or you know just from focusing on one goal and putting your mind and heart to it uh, completely relate to that <laughs> but yeah that that's really really inspiring uh, after you came from the hyperloop competition and you said you you took this tour of the spacex facility uh what were some of the tiny steps which you took uh to build pixel um it that's a good question so i think one first thing was like reading up a lot a lot of research we had to like make sure that the thing that we are going after that our thesis or our hypothesis had to be strong we need to verify it by talking to customers we need to talk we need to verify it by talking to industry experts in the field uh, because we were betting something that okay there is a gap and an opportunity here and if we go out and build satellites for this that we can make a business out of it and if that thesis didn't really pan out then everything was lost so first was this reading up as much as we could about space and the specific areas that we are going after uh, the second was reaching out to experts in the field getting their advice because no matter how much you learn on the internet the amount kind of information you can get with people who have been in the domain is, is different so uh, we just like the internet is a beautiful wonderful place uh, we just sent cold emails to people like dr a s kiran kumar he was the ex chairman of isro uh, he called us to his office we went there we talked to him he gave us a lot of ideas in terms of what to do uh, we reached out to cnr rao you know uh, like one of the most eminent scientists he reached out come on to the office um uh, and it happened internationally as well like people who are at space and we just sent out a cold email and then people um, just were some of the people were you know very willing to be able to talk and give us insights which which really helped so that was the second step uh, and during this time this refining the plan and whether what we were going after made a sense um after that it was a bunch of boring stuff you know putting together the website putting together the pitch deck um um going the uh, like and then i think once we had that we as i said we talked to people in our own batch as well as the junior batch to say we have a plan here we want to go out and build a satellite in bangalore uh do you want to come on in the summer vacations and um, thankful people came like because of their own money they were paying their own money to stay there we didn't like we didn't have the money to give them we didn't have the money to sustain ourselves but uh there was that just one dream that we want to build a satellite and send it up there that it brought us all together um and during that time we just reached out to like whatever avenue we could find uh, we reached out to people to say can you manufacture this satellite for us can you manufacture this component of the satellite for us and similarly we were working with a few people to see whether they could invest in it whether they could sponsor it um um and after a point once we had the design done once we know we had done all that we could with the money we have the next step was going out and raising external funding um and here is i think um uh, In 2018, there was this event in Silicon Valley called uh, BitSync. It's where the Bitsians in Silicon Valley came together to be able to reminisce their time. And there was a startup pitch event there. It seemed like a, a good place to be able to go and pitch because these were people that had made it in life, that had the money to be able to do it, and they could relate. Um, now there were, I would say, about three days to this event in the US. We had been selected for the competition, but we didn't have the money to book the tickets, and it was during the mid-semester examination. um i managed to convince uh, a person at one of the uh, companies who were a customer to us we were working on satellite imagery analytics for them convince them that if you pay for this ticket we'll go there we'll raise money it's good for you it's good for us three days before the event they managed to book the ticket uh, i still don't know how and why they did that but thankful for that um and surprisingly out of the two things that i mentioned the tougher one was to convince the professor so let me give the mid term later uh they say go to arc get this letter you need to get this letter and what not and uh, <laughs> um 
my flight was like three days to the event two days later was the flight uh, and i had one day in between to get all that in place uh, convince the professors gave them the letters and flew in there uh, i had cold emailed a few people as well that i would want to meet them separately from the event they said yeah come on over and those were the people that said okay you're doing something cool if this works out which will get a name uh, and it's something cool so we would like to put in money um, after that yeah it's just taking that money and executing on it building the satellite uh, so yeah those would be the steps i would say this is so very fascinating because of one basic reason that when i went to college i was told that cold emails don't work and <laughs> that has turned out to be so untrue for me personally and now that i know your story it's if if you know how to write a cold email that's a great skill and i feel what you conquered was a lot because you actually took the effort and time to reach out and a lot of it through cold Absolutely. emails yeah no i think cold emails are good as long as they are written rightly uh, right. if like anyone wants to build a skill set they should look at writing good interesting cold emails that can get responses for sure um i'm going to end the episode with three random questions the first one would be what one advice would you now give to your 18 year old self who was just getting into college i think the one advice would be um, if there's a good opportunity coming your way take it like it's it's like that quote i said if you are offered a seat on a rocket ship don't ask why just get it just get on um so the advice would be this right like uh, when i look back and i tried different things in college and then i figured out that this is a thing that i love and this is what i want to do for the rest of my life so my advice to my younger self would be figure out and like experience as many things as you can and as and when you go through them you will figure out what is it that you exactly want to be able to do and don't say to no to an opportunity just because it might not seem interesting them at least give it a serious look and 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 just like find what you love and what you would want to do for the rest of your life and get in uh, uh, a lot many more people are unhappy just because they settle for something less than what they like like Um, so figure out something you love and just go out and, and do it. I think that makes a lot of sense. I I really stand by the thought of exploring as much as you can, and that can only happen when you say yes. Uh, I think the second question would be on similar lines, but this is more entrepreneurial in nature. What would be three entrepreneurial lessons which you would give yourself? Because it's been uh, more than two years now that you have started Pixel, so. Uh, some entrepreneurial advices so i think one would be ideas are for shit it's the execution that matters like you can have the best idea in the world but if you don't act on it if you don't show that you have a plan for it and you have started acting on that plan then the one city going to like put money or you're not going to really make it anyway so starting is a very important thing but you know you have an idea great but then to execute that idea is everything uh, a lot many more people will have the same idea as you it's how you execute it that differentiate it and the second is uh, just be shameless i would say <laughs> a lot of people Uh, and shameless within respectable bounds when i say shameless not being rude or blunt uh, but like be shameless in the sense that if you don't understand anything just ask directly like if you're talking to the investor and they're sort of stringing you along tell them like like this is what we want we want to be able to like we don't want to string us along so be shameless follow up send cold emails send reminders call them up if they don't pick up um and just try and get like do what you want to do be by being shameless within respectable bounds um so i think that would be the thing and third is never never ever give up uh, there's always going to be times that things are going to be hard uh, and until you have exhausted all the possible options that you can do and after that there's just no point in going on like don't give up until then like we could have given up so many times in in our journey personally i can tell you but then we didn't and like it always always works out as long as you keep trying one or the other thank you for valuable insights i have to say um talking about your personal life What are some of the long-term goals that you have for yourself? Not for Pixel, but your your life and you know your personal goals, your career-wise goals. So my personal goal uh, in life. Um, so I've also been reading about what the purpose of life in general is and what the purpose of one's life in general is. And uh, I think what I've come to the conclusion is there's no overarching purpose in life. It's what each person wants to do that is their purpose in life. And I think what makes me happy and my purpose, like and my purpose in life, would be to help. humanity progress to a type 1 and eventually a type 2 civilization uh, and what i would mean by that essentially is um, like there is a scale called the kardashev scale which talks about what level uh, each civilization is in like it could be human humanity as a civilization it could be any other alien civilization type 1 is when they have mastered their own planet 
that they're able to control what's happening in their own planet, get energy out of it, be it control the weather and whatnot, uh, and be able to, you know, be have renewable energy. So having control over one's planet is type one, and type two is having control over one's solar system. Uh, and I think in the next hundred years, we do have the opportunity to go to a type two uh, if we're able to do progress. So this ties back into the fact that I'm a huge believer of, uh, you know, uh, uh, utopians, technological utopians. Utopism, uh, which essentially states that technology has its, you know, bad things and there will be harms that will come out of it, but it has tremendous capability to be able to make everyone's life better and move forward. Uh, so my thing, my my goal would be to be able to use technology to help humanity progress there, uh, and we're doing that through satellites to start with, right? With the satellites, we'll be able to track climate change and be able to give better insights in terms of how to do that. Uh, in the future, there might be satellites which might help with cloud seeding that would help rain in the areas where you might need rain. Uh, uh, and for example, you know, California fire shelter. If you had a satellite that could seed the clouds over there and then, you know, it could rain, it would help save so much things. So um, I think that would be the thing that would want to work on technology uh, like, you know, nuclear energy. Nuclear energy can help bring down carbon emissions by a lot. I would like to work eventually on maybe nanotechnology or biotechnology that can help make things better. So that would be my personal goal. It's fairly lofty and I might not be able to get to a lot of those things, but uh, I've started with space tech and let's see where this goes and maybe uh, next we'll see what happens. With the pace that Pixel is going, I deeply believe that you will be able to solve <laughs> these problems. If not all, then at least some of them. But yeah, thank you. Kind, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show. This was by far the most insightful conversation I've ever had on this podcast. And I, I personally learned a lot from it. And I'm deeply fascinated by the things that I, you know, want to read from, from this conversation onwards. But thank you so much for coming, Avais. Happy to be here, Ayush. Uh, keep making the awesome videos you make. Uh, and uh, like even though I'm not able to travel a lot, I at least get to travel through you. So thanks for having me. This has been good uh, from my side. Of <laughs> thank you so much, Avais. And all the best to you and the entire team at Pixel. <laughs> thanks, Ayush. Thank you. <laughs>